obviously this is February uh, being heart month so we want to increase awareness about heart disease some of those things we can prevent um, and work on some of the risk factors out there and obviously exercise is one of them not that it's why we made you park so far away and walk but it is one of those things we'll talk about and I, and I appreciate Megan introducing our team uh, up here. We want it to be pretty open discussion for you guys. And we'll hand around a microphone. You guys feel free to answer, ask questions that you've been thinking of. Um, it's pretty unique to have the perspective that we have up here. A couple of things I did want to mention about Dr. Ducek is she recently got board certified in obesity medicine last year, which is a great, great thing. It can really apply that to her other boards. And uh, she's boarded in cardiovascular disease and echocardiography as well. So um, it really is great that we have her on our team and she can give us great education advice and tie that in as well as applicable. So the first thing we wanted to talk about a little bit is some of the signs and symptoms. And we've got a little video that Jeff, the nature guy, was kind enough to help us out with, with one of our ER physicians, uh, Dr. Randy Thompson, and one of our cardiologists, um, interventional cardiologists, Dr. Benjamin Plank, and just sort of help give that perspective as far as some of the things that we want to teach and educate you guys a little bit on signs and symptoms of, of heart attacks. The one thing that we want to gain out of this and what we always look at in healthcare and I look at is what do we learn from, from each other? What do we learn from either our mistakes or the positives and negatives? And that's our goal is for you guys to learn from us and from, from TJ and, and how, do we, how do we approach this in the future? So I'm going to play this quick video here. Hey guys, Jeff the Nature Guy here at Billings Clinic and I'm here today to talk about heart attack awareness. Did you know heart disease is the number one killer of both men and women? So today we're going to meet with both a cardiologist and an ER doctor to talk about the signs and symptoms of a heart attack and why calling 911 is so important. But here's a twist. What we're going to do is we're going to put those doctors under some of their own stresses with the help of some of my friends like Fred the Cockroach here and Mesa the Cofer Snake. Come on inside and join me. I am joined by two of the great doctors of Billings Clinic, Dr. Thompson, an ER doctor here, and Dr. Plank, a cardiologist. Now the important thing is, is to know the signs and the symptoms of a heart attack. And imagine this, there is a lot of reluctance to call 911. Now, Dr. Thompson, of course, there, obviously I would imagine heart attacks are very scary, but why on earth would somebody be reluctant to call 911? Well, they might be scared. They might be in denial that they're having a heart attack. They might not want to inconvenience their family or call an ambulance to their house in the middle of the night. Um, and they just don't recognize the signs or symptoms of a heart attack. Now, Dr. Dr. Plank, a question for you is that when somebody calls 911 and you guys are pre preparing for this individual to come in, what do you guys do here at the hospital to prepare for that? Well, Jeff, time is muscle when it comes to a heart attack. As soon as emergency services are contacted, we can begin to prepare for a patient's arrival. If it turns out that the patient is actually having a heart attack, this can be identified in the field by the EMT crew. The ambulances in Yellowstone County are able to transmit EKGs and other patient identification uh, information to the emergency room so that we're ready for them. And we have a team of doctors, nurses, and technicians who are on call 24 hours a day in our cardiac cath lab. The amazing thing to me is that calling 911 can actually shave about 20 minutes really off of your prep time, getting things ready here, so basically it's adding 20 minutes to your survival time. Is that true? That's exactly that right, Jeff. That's am it amazes me. All right, so you guys know we brought you here today to make this incredible video about heart attack awareness. But the other thing I wanted to do is I wanted to have a little contest between the doctors here to see if you really know the signs and symptoms of a heart attack here today. So what we're going to do is we're going to have 60 seconds on the clock, and I want you to go back and forth with the different signs and symptoms of a heart attack. But as you guys are going back and forth, I'm going to increase your stress load, see if we can get that heart rate up a little bit to show some of those true signs. And the way I'm going to do that, well, I've got a couple friends of the zoo that I'm going to introduce to you. All right, go. Chest pain. Chest pressure. Shortness of breath. Trouble breathing. Nausea. Uh, sweating. Vomiting. Fatigue. Uh, heartburn. Um, sweating. <laughs> uh, back pain. Sweating. I think you said that. A, a feeling of I'm sweating. doom. 
I see sweat. Okay. Inability to talk. <laughs> Um, shortness of breath. Anxiety. Oh. Dizziness. You guys okay? Do I need Dropping. Like palpitations, like your heart is racing. Ten seconds. Neck pain. Feeling of fullness. Jaw pain. What? Wow. We're up. We're taught. You guys did unbelievable under the pressure that you were under. This is real. I mean, this is true fear that you're seeing here. You guys did great. And we got to thank these guys, the Madagascar hissing cockroach. Not so bad when you see them up close. This is Fred, by the way. And then we got Mesa, who is a gopher snake found down in the south. We have snakes like this here in Montana. A pretty cool looking animal and pretty nice, right? Yeah, yeah he's pretty nice. <laughs> now get him off you. Is that what you're trying yes, to say? Please. Sure. Guys, thank you both so much for all the wisdom you did here today. And of course, being good sports with these animals. I will take your anxiety level down and I will remove these animals for you. But again, what you guys did is just valuable and hopefully, as we said, save some lives. So guys, I'm Jeff the Nature Guy here at the Billings Clinic. And remember, call 911. Fifty-eight versus what? Here at the clinic, and, and basically what it's doing is adding twenty minutes to your survival rate. I mean, that's just amazing to think about. That's correct. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Heart Perfect. <laughs> 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 just say, yep. Now they know. <laughs> yeah, now I'm too excited. Shortness breath. Sweaty. Oh! oh my God. <laughs> we'll, do, we'll do that again. Yeah, well, what's the number if you guys reach that? We should be concerned. Uh, if it stops. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That was a good question. I need you out there doing what you guys do best, so I'll help you out. But thank you for all of your hard work today. And again, that wisdom that hopefully will save some lives out there. So obviously they had quite a bit of fun doing that too. But what we wanted to try to do in doing that was sort of bring to light some of those things that obviously we're trying to get more people to be aware of. What do you think one of the main things that we're trying to, that the numbers piece we've talked about that was brought up, a big one is... Montana versus the national average is the amount of time to call 911. And Joni's going to really talk about this a little more. But for Montana, it's an average of four hours before we call 911 versus the national average is two hours. Why is that? Every, we're tough as nails. I don't <laughs> denial, some of those things. It, those are real things that I think, you know, is, is living in rural Montana and, you know, we're self-sufficient. We're used to doing things on our own. Um, we don't want to come to the hospital, feel like we can just tough it out, make it through. But as, we, as we'll talk about, and Dr. Duchek's going to talk about a little more, um, that increases, that's going to, that time factor is going to affect how you do potentially after also, because time, when we work in healthcare, and I'm a nurse by background, time is muscle. So that clock is ticking when we think about those things. Um, as the data sort of states, about every 43 seconds, someone in the US has a heart attack. Um, there is gonna be a test on anatomy and physiology before you guys are allowed to leave. But how many of you have had like a 12, those 12 lead EKGs where you put all those little funny patches on you, on your legs, your arms, and all over your chest? Probably quite a few of you. We can look at those, and Dr. Juchek can explain and, and tell which vessel, which artery that we're, that'll show that is suspected when we look at that test that we're doing. Um, and how, and that feeds that muscle as part of the heart. Dr. Duchek, I'm gonna put you on the spot a little bit and talk about cholesterol, plaque, and, and fat, and how that, some things that, you know, the audience can relate to and understand. We'll talk about 
risk factors in their hearing. I'm just kidding. And you uh, <laughs> can go from there, if you wouldn't mind. OK, so um, I don't even know where to start. First, I'm going to start and repeat. I really, really appreciate everyone being here, because it means a lot to Billings Clinic and overall our nations, because we want to stay healthy. I want to appreciate that you asked me to be here, and I'm very happy. My heart is very happy. So now coming to heart attack. Those symptoms can be sometimes very tricky, and, and uh, like Rich said and Dr. Plank, times this muscle. What it means, we have to get there as quickly as we can, because if the tissue doesn't get nutrients and oxygen, it's simply dying. So we want to do everything to go quickly and open the, open the artery. It doesn't matter what way we're going to use, because there's two different ways we can do. Let's say there's someone in Sydney, and I get the phone call, and this patient is having heart attack, acute heart attack. Let's say th there's no way they can get this patient here within two hours, one, 20 minutes, the best, right? They can't. So what I'm going to say, go ahead and give the medication which can simply lyse the clot and open the artery. This is the way to treat, but it's not ideal. Only 50% of patients will end with the open artery, okay? So still the balloon and stent are the best. But you know what? You do what you can do to open the artery and save the muscle. So this is something what we're going to try to do. So we're trying to do as quickly as we can. On your side is you have to tell us that something is going on. Because if you're going to sit and wait and wait, then of course we're going to start losing more and more. And when should you call? This is another very tricky part. And you know, let's say the, the, the right coronary artery, which supplies the back of the heart, very often presents as an indigestion. You know, how many patients I had and say, you know, I didn't have anything. It was just a little bit of belching, a little bit of burning sensation in my stomach, nothing really, no really chest pain. And then I took Tums or whatever, whatever. And of course, listen, the heart attack at some point will stop. You're not going to have chest pain forever. So, you know, they say, well, you know, I, I took the Tums and after 30, 40 minutes, the pain was gone. And the patient comes and we do whatever test and it comes that there was indeed a heart attack. So some symptoms can be very tricky, but you know, you just have to, and you know, how many times I talk to my patients and when they go back, they're gonna tell you, you know what, Dr. Barbara, yes, a couple of months, I'm not really exactly the way I used to. I just feel tired, run down, I don't have energy, I can't really go and do this stuff I used to, it takes longer. So there's sometimes in between some signs which we kind of push, oh, is the age or we overwork, which is true. So, you know, we just have to bring the awareness and, and know that something like this may. So maybe if you're not quite sure, you should call someone and say, hey, I have this like for 20 minutes, what should I do? It's not going away and blah, blah, blah. Maybe this is what you need to make the decision to call or not to call. So that's something what is very important. Otherwise, we're gonna start losing more and more. If it comes to, and you know, when you arrive to a place when they can provide the assessment, like emergency room, they're gonna give you oxygen, they're gonna come with the EKG, and that's the part when we're gonna have more information. We have to remember the EKG is going to be abnormal when you have a chest pain. So when you get there and the chest pain is gone, okay, sometimes we may not see much. There are also certain areas in a, in a blood supply of the heart which will, will not show up on the EKG. So sometimes when we don't see anything, it still doesn't mean that you don't have acute heart attack. Like the high, high lateral wall, okay, the lateral wall all the way up you may not see much on the EKG. So then what we do, the next step is we go and get the biomarkers, the troponin. I'm pretty sure you, some of you are familiar, and that's the biomarker. What this means, there are certain enzymes which should be inside the cell, the heart, cardiac muscle cell, inside. They should not be outside. But when there is an injury, the enzymes are released, and it's why we can detect them in the bloodstream. This doesn't happen right away. We cannot detect them if you had 40 minutes of chest pain and you arrive in emergency room. It takes six hours, sometimes a little bit longer before we're going to see it. So, you know, we can, soon we have you in the right place, we can step in and start helping you and, 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 and forming the diagnosis. Sit down.
do check before we go on further. Okay. We'll ask some over. Say again, how long it takes to read EKG? Right away. Right away. If there is acute heart attack, there's no question. No, 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 no. The evolution of, okay, the question was how quickly we can accurately read the EKG right away. If you come to emergency room with ST elevation, acute myocardial infarction, there's a, it's absolutely black and white, black and white. The 24 hours, then you're going to see the evolution of the EKG because there's going to be a change. But when you walk in and the artery is completely occluded, there's nothing you can miss, honestly. It's just, that's it. So absolutely right away. You're welcome. So again, we, we uh, are honored that's to you. have... <laughs> yep. <laughs> TJ Haynes, who... Um, the reason we wanted him to come is just to tell his side of the story, just like anybody else, as far as, okay, here's the patient perspective, what can we learn from it? Um, and uh, I'll let TJ sort of explain what he was sort of minding his own, his own business, just sort of sighting guns in at the gun range on Memorial Day. We'll go from there. So go ahead, TJ. Oh. I gotta get wired up. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi. First of all, thank you very much for inviting my wife, Jackie, and me to speak here today. Um, I think it's a proof of the staff and Dr. Duchak, a good uh, a testament of their good work that I was able to survive the third quarter of the Super Bowl this year, and I thought the Broncos were about to kill me. So, uh, Start at the beginning. Uh, you know, every, every symptom that they mentioned in the uh, video was, was right on. I had been um, experiencing some uh, uh, minor indigestion for, uh, for a couple of days before Memorial Day, um, a, a minor aching back. It wasn't anything out of the, out of the ordinary. Uh, but I went to the range on Memorial Day on, on May 25th and uh, getting ready for the Quigley shoot, which is a black powder rifle shoot. And uh, I walked out to the 300-yard range and started feeling um, really tired and just like uh, onslaught of flu. I thought, oh, gosh, you know, I don't, I don't want to spend a couple of days in bed, you know. I'm just, I'm just weak, but, but not necessarily nauseous. But, uh, and I started arguing with myself, you know, what does it mean to be short of breath? I don't know what that means, you know. But I, but I, uh, I thought, well, you know, this is kind of weird. But again, it just felt like the flu. So I, set up my targets and I walked back to the, the line and uh, I shot for 15 or 20 minutes and felt great. You know, back, went, back ache went away and, and uh, felt, you know, I had energy now, so it's like, cool. And I, um, after that I walked back out to the 300 yard line to, to change my targets and that's when I knew something was definitely wrong. I mean, I, I still remember that, that thought in my head and say, like, man, something, something is not right. Um, I feel like I could just take a nap right now and I've been through enough first aid classes that probably everybody has. And you start, you know, thinking, well, do I feel pain in my jaw? No, I, I don't have any pain radiating from my arms. In fact, I don't really have any pain in my chest other than, than the indigestion again. So, you know, I right, set so my targets. I, I always start walking back to the firing line. I get to the 200-yard line. And I have to get on my, I, I put my hands on my knees and it's like, wow, I'm, I'm really out of breath. I mean, this is, this is crazy. There, there's something wrong. But I don't feel nauseous. I don't feel like I'm going to be sick, but something's not right. So, you know, guys are waiting for me. It's like, hurry up, get back to the line. So I do. And uh, I was like, wow, I'm going to just go back to the truck and, and uh, sit down on the tailgate for a while. So I do that. And... Like, like an idiot that I am. I, I, you go through the, the same denials that they talked about. It's like, well, this can't be a heart attack because I'm only 20, you know, 30. You know, I'm 40. No, crap, I'm 50. Shit, you know, when did that happen? So, you know, I was like, yeah, you know, but I don't have any pain. But, you know, if I go to the emergency room, they're going to say, well, we don't, we don't see anything wrong with you. You know, so, okay, well, there's $400 shot, you know. And I'm certainly not going to call an ambulance because there's, you know, there's a lot of money there probably, you know. Now, I don't know any of these things, and all that turned out not to be true at all. 
So, you know, I called my wife. Hey, you're going to have to take me to the hospital. And she's like, why? I said, because I don't know. There's something wrong. You know, all right, you know, I'll come down. Now, it's really idiotic because you need a gate, cat, gate pass to get through the gate at the range. But I figure she'll, she'll work around it. And so um, I call her and, and the other guys at the range. And this is, this is, I mean, they're much smarter than me. And they're like, hey, dude, you know, there's something wrong with you, huh? I said, yeah, I, I'm just not, I can't catch my breath. They said, well, we're going to call 911. It's like, well, it's out of my hands now, you know. <laughs> I mean, this can't, and, and that's the first thought, that's the first time I thought, God, could this really be a heart attack? I mean, you know, I, I don't have the pain, but it, it, it's getting kind of, getting kind of bad, but, uh, but I don't know. I've never had a heart attack before. So, so they called 911, and, and I was like, oh, gosh, what's going to happen to my rifle, my gear, my spinning scope? Ooh, you know. I, I don't have the energy now to, to pack the stuff up. And they were awesome. They were really great guys. And they packed it up for me. I drove my truck down to the, the, the gate. And there I see the ambulance and the fire truck coming. And it's like, oh, gosh, you know. Here it is. Here. And, and, you know, as a layman, I'm thinking heart attack means open heart surgery. It means losing work for, for months. You know, it means uh, uh, all, you know, early retirement. I wasn't really a retiree. I, you know, it's like, oh, this is, this is screwed, you know. So the, the ambulance crew is great, you know, and they, they put me in the ambulance and, and they ask the question that I know you, you guys are all familiar with, you know, on a scale from one to 10, where's the pain? And say, how in the world do you answer that? You know, it's like, well, it's definitely worse than childbirth. <laughs> but, oh, what's that? How do I know? I'll tell you I know. I'm glad you asked. Because women will have two or three kids. Why? I don't know. I'm never volunteering for another heart attack. So there's my proof that this is working. I worked on that a long time. Huh? So anyway, so, oh, you know, so you don't want to seem like a wimp and, and say uh, an eight, you know, because it, it wasn't. But you don't want to say a three. It's like, well, why did you call us if it's only three? So you go five. So they, you know, start hooking things up, and they're kind of, they, you know, well, where do you want to go? It's like, well, Billings Clinic, you know, because I'm thinking, where's my preferred provider, and where's my health insurance cover? And, uh, and boy, I tell you, the, the ride to the, the hospital was pretty non-eventful. They're asking questions, giving me nitroglycerin tablets and, and whatnot, and, and I go into the emergency room, and I'm thinking, oh, yeah, here's where we're going to spend a long time. Nope. Man, through the emergency room into the cath lab, and, and that's what, you know, that, the technology is just amazing. And that's when Dr. Tample tells me, hey, you're having a really big heart attack. I mean, this is the real deal. And I remember telling him, don't tell me that. Just tell me it's indigestion. Give me a pill or something. And they said, well, we could treat it with medication, just like you're saying. But your survival rate is much higher if you have a, a procedure. <laughs> it's like, wow, you know, survival. You're talking survival here. So yeah, yeah, do, do the procedure, you know. So, um, uh, so he says, yeah, we're going to put a, a stand in your heart. It's like, okay, well, you know, I'm sure you're going to knock me out and, and put me under, and I won't remember any of this, and I'll wake up in a, in a, in a recovery room. And uh, they're saying, no, you know, we're, we'll get it in fairly quick. And they're talking amongst themselves. And I said, wow, hey, I feel fine. No, I, I think it's past now. <laughs> and they start laughing. It's like, no, dude, we just opened up the stent. It's like, you did? I mean, you put it in, and oh yeah, it's all done. So it's like, wow. I mean, you need to tell people this. It's like, you know, it's not a heart attack. Doesn't mean open heart surgery. It doesn't, you know, all the time. So they wheel it, they wheel me to ICU, and and I'll close with this. I mean, I don't know, you probably have more questions, but don't pe give people pepperoni pizza in the ICU. I mean, that is not a good idea. <laughs> you know, only a moron like me has a pepperoni pizza, not thinking, well, I'm going to be laying here for the next two days, you know, and, you know, sure enough, chest pains come back and wheel the EKG machine in and, and hook me up and say, no, you idiot, you know, don't, don't have a pizza in the ICU. <laughs> but anyway, and that was it. I mean, the rest of it is very non-eventful. I lost a total of four days of work, and really I didn't have to do that, but... Uh, Went back to work and started exercising right away and, and doing the, uh, the uh, cardio rehab uh, routine. And uh, went out and bought an elliptical machine. I've been doing that ever since. And just trying to do the best I can to stick around for my wife and my kids. So that's about my whole. I don't think you're trying to be doing this. There's nothing to try after acute heart attack. What's that? There's nothing to try. There's uh, nothing to try when you had heart attack, if you don't mind. Cool. There's nothing to try. From that point, that's the turning point. You have to start taking things differently because it did happen. 
Doesn't mean that you have to be depressed, put life on hold, and sit at home and do nothing. Just the opposite. But you have to realize that whatever happened, it happened. And in some patients, suffer from acute heart attack because of genetic part. That's something what we can change. But the other part, the high blood pressure, the weight problem, the cholesterol, you can actually change. So from that point, you have to change. There's no more nothing like I'm going to try. You have to do it. And what really, really makes me really sad, and I'm very sincere when I say this, when I see patients like this and they're back in my office, they suffer either heart attack with stent like you or even the next step more serious, open heart surgery. And they're back in my office three months later, their weight is up, they don't exercise, and they eat again. I always ask my question when I go home, even though I try to close my office door and forget about work, sometimes I go home and I still cannot forget. What it takes for some of us to change, because whatever you've done until the heart attack, let me tell you, it didn't work. It's time for you to change. You have to change, that's the only way. I was in ICU rounding on the weekend. There was a lady who was in her early 60s. She came with acute heart attack. She had stand put and she was in recovery. The whole family was in the room. I was covering for my partner and they come with 50 million different questions. I'm, oh my God. You know, but okay, I'm there and I say, okay, let's face it. So I'm there and I'm trying to. So one of the question was, and I said, okay, well, everything ended well. You're in the recovery process. So we're going to get you for exercise and this. Oh, my mom, she's an exercise freak. She exercises every day, like, you know, 40 minutes and five or six times a week. And look what happened to her. And I turned to this young lady. I said, if she haven't done this, she would have the heart attack 20 years ago. You have to remember, you can ch change the course. I'm telling you, you can. And I can see many patients who've changed. Like I just said, one patient, he's, he was admitted because of high blood pressure. Now his blood pressure is fine. He lost seven pounds. He's in exercise. You can do it. The way I see this sometimes, and it happens to all of us, we become very selfish in a way. We just want to do what, what, what really gives us the joy. But we forget, uh, forgot about the family, the husband, the wife, the kids, who are actually crying in the corners because they see that the father continued to smoke, continued to eat fat, and doesn't cha didn't change diet. I had patient, 375 pounds. I sent her to weight reduction clinic because I know I'm going to lose this lady. She comes with her daughter, OK? Even being in a weight reduction clinic, she gained nine pounds. So she was expelled from the clinic because they're not going to take her. And you know she's going to fail, even if they're going to do the surgery. Her daughter was crying. And honestly, I dropped my hands. Very rarely I do so. But there was nothing. She built the shield. Nothing was crossing. And she's going to go. And at some point, we're going to lose her. And it's unfortunate because she's very young. And to me, it's a very selfish approach. Because if I saw my daughter crying, I don't know what I would do. I would do anything to be sure that I'm going to stick. Because remember, it's not the Easter this year. It's the Easter 10 years from now. I want you to be there in a good shape. Men have different attributes as far as having pain to heart attack. What do women have? No, the question is, how much different are the symptoms that comes to a man and woman? That men have a little bit different threshold and maybe different symptoms. You know, in general, okay, I know everybody says women get different symptoms. Yes, we do get different symptoms, but still we come with chest pain. So don't ignore the chest pain. Women, I think just because the way we are busy with every they schedule and, and, and chores and this. We, we kind of ignore and blame. We're tired. We're more short of bread because we've done so much. We have to look after kids, do the laundry, cook, go to work. So it is very busy schedule. And I'm not ignoring the, the male part in a family. I mean, you are important. Don't take me wrong. So yes, we come sometimes just with the chest pain. But remember, the threshold sometimes is different. What I'm going to call pain, you may call maybe a little bit of tightness. So, you know, it's different, it's different. So I think you just have to start to know your body. 
And uh, let me tell you, if you're going to walk and you get chest pains and it's pretty consistent, you better call someone and talk to someone. If the pain comes when you're watching TV and, you know, and it gets worse when you take a deep breath, I wouldn't really jump and call 911 or, you know, go to emergency room. Most likely it's a little bit of pleurisy or at least call maybe a nurse and kind of confirm that this is what it is. But if the pain is reproducible, if the pain gets worse with breathing, it's less likely. But if this is something what is pretty consistent, you walk, you get chest pain, you stop, it goes away, that's the red flag. We'll keep moving along here a little bit. What we wanted to show, and I know this has come up a little bit as we, we've talked through TJ's case, and like I said, he's kind enough to share his, his side of it but basically show sort of the time breakdown of him being taken care of and then that EKG that classic. the audience was asking about. Some of those things we look for are classic, sort of the, there's like a, oh, it's a peak basically where the line doesn't come back down, but that, those are the things we look for. Dr. Duchek looks for and knows right away. This is what we call the ST segment elevation. That's how we describe this, but it's like a, like a tomb. And you go to graveyard. This is what it is. This, this is the ST elevation. And certain part of the EKG, I can actually pretty accurately say which artery on your heart is actually occluded. So this really helps. But like I said, some of the areas, the EKG is not really very helpful. So you have to take the next step. We're going to lead into a little more of that with Joni's assistance and the work she does, but basically breaking down this time frame to let you know what we're doing nowadays with technology and the work that Joni's doing is we're able to, they're able to get, obtain these 12 lead EKGs, the ambulances, and they're able to send those, they transmit them while basically the patient or yourself is in the ambulance. That way we can prepare the cath lab team, the ER, we know well ahead what's coming. We know how to prepare, and that's why for TJ, we we're able to really go right by the emergency department um, with activating. We call the code STEMI here. Once they see this, we know what we're looking at. They get the cath lab team ready. They get the table ready, the, the cardiologist, Dr. Sample, and they're able to really do this within basically 27 minutes when he, hit the, when he rolled in from the ambulance bay. When the ambulance met him up at the gun range, it was 46 minutes. They look across the nation, we want a goal, but 90 minutes is a measurement for us to benchmark against. But that is uh, pretty remarkable results. But that shows what we're trying to do with educate everybody on calling 911, trying to activate all these things as early as we can. Because again, what we're talking about, time is muscle. A couple things we did, we're able to get, and TJ was kind enough to show, is these are the, the, the uh, basically the images off the angiogram from the heart cath showing, and this is the left anterior descending artery, and Dr. Duchek, you can expand a little more if you wish, but basically it's showing this should be the same size going right through this section right there. You can see how narrow it is right there. So all that muscle down in here is going without blood flow causing his symptoms. So that's, that was the angiogram before. This shows basically the stent. Basically they put a little balloon in there, open up that area of blockage and plaque, and then slide a stent up there. Once they pull back out, let me go one more, and there it is after. So you can see how, again, now that's blood flow is maintained with before that blockage after it and how that works. Any questions that Dr. Duchek might be able to answer on that? Is there any point in time when they could not do that? So the question is, is there any point in time they cannot do that? And I can let her answer that. It would be better. Put this then? Yeah. Um. Actually, the only time when they can put stand is time-wise, there's no restriction. For the thrombolytics, there is a restriction because after a certain time, it's not going to work. If it comes to stent, yes. Actually, they can actually pretty much go after anything. There could be a difficult time for them to open up. There are situations when they cannot go and open it up. But if we're talking about acute heart attack, most of the times, they actually, I would say 95%, maybe even more, they, they go and they're able to open because it's a fresh clot. 
so they can just go with the wire, cross this, bring the balloon, open the area, put the stand, and it's done. So for acute heart attack, yes, they can actually go and open up actually pretty much everything. <coughs> Well, it can push a little bit. Sometimes if they see, uh, if they, what happens with the clot if the clot can be uh, pushed down? If they see there is a huge burden of clot, there is a device that can actually suck the clot out. And then they're going to put the stand and then go with the balloon open and then and, and the stand stays in. So, but there are situations when the clot can shower down. So those are the patients who have post angioplasty, still a little bit of soreness, a little bit of pain. And sometimes we can't really avoid this. It's just, you know, sometimes you have to just pick up the less evil and go and, and save overall most of the myocardium and sometimes you have to sacrifice. Sometimes they have to sacrifice some of those little branches when they go with stand because when they're going to put the stand, they may actually close it. So, you know, so it is it's a situation when they're trying to save as much as they can but sometimes they have to sacrifice a little bit. Yes? Can the body reject the stents? No, no. The, can the body reject stent? No. It's just such a, uh, a small um, a, a piece of metal, you can't really have allergic reaction to it, no. The body will incorporate it. What, happen, the, what happens with the stent? So this is what happens. When patient receive drug looted stent, and that's the reason why the patient is asked to continue plavix, because it's a foreign body, something which shouldn't be inside your, uh, one of the artery on the surface of your heart. So the plavix will prevent from clotting, but it takes up to six to, to eight months when you're gonna see the endothelium. Endothelium is a single layer organ because it can produce so many hormones. It's a single layer um, uh, uh, which covers inside the, the stent. So after a certain time, uh, let's say autopsy, if we, we go and look, you can't even see the stent inside because it's just covered and looks pretty much like the rest of the artery. But it takes time. So from here, I, I, and I talked a little bit about this, um, and this is, uh, that's why we, one reason we have um, Joni Hope here, who is the Montana um, Director for Mission Lifeline, who's affiliated with American Heart Association. I want her to talk a little bit about the work they've been doing throughout the state in our area, um, and really everything that we're talking about and how it applies. Um, Joni? Okay. I didn't know we were gonna walk around. I didn't wear sensible shoes. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to stand right here. <laughs> so Mission Lifeline Montana is um, a grant-funded program we have in our state, and it's a three-year initiative to kind of put the building bo blocks in place to build a system of care for heart attack patients. And when we talk about a system of care, we're talking about every single party that plays a role in getting your vessel opened as quick as possible. And um, you may not know this, but you're the, first, you're the first important party in that whole system. But the system won't work unless you call 911. Are you going to advance the slide? <laughs> <laughs> so this is kind of a picture of what it would look like, um, ideally what we want it to look like. What happens in the state here in the past couple years is more sequential. So a patient would experience symptoms, call 911, an ambulance would pick a patient up, take a patient to their local emergency department, and if they live around Billings, that would, they would come to you know, a PCI center or a cath lab capable hospital to that emergency department, where they would then get an EKG, and then they would determine treatment. But now, um, what our goal is, is we're putting equipment in all of the EMS agencies or the ambulances across the state that can transmit that EKG from your home or from wherever you're having a heart attack. So instead of things happening sequentially, they can transmit that EKG right when they get to you. And when I tell you in Billings, the average time is three minutes. From the time your EMTs are on site, they'll have that, trans that EKG in your cardiologist's hands within three minutes. And then they can determine care. So they can activate the cath lab right away. And oftentimes in our rural areas, those patients don't even need to stop at that local emergency department. If they can get to Billings Clinic within 120 minutes, they will just use that time 
of patient transfer before the patient gets to the ad emergency department to determine how they're going to get the patient to Billings Clinic. So it's a really important piece of equipment to get. But again, it all starts with you. So right now, I think only 14% of Montanans call 911 when they're having a heart attack. And that's pretty scary to think about. So we really encourage you to look at those symptoms and think about what's going on with your body and call 911. This time is muscle. Well, I kind of covered this. Uh, yeah, so an EKG can tell Dr. Ducek or the other cardiologists or your emergency room physicians if you're having a heart attack right away, and they can even pinpoint the part of your heart where it is. So they can have the cath lab activated and everything prepped and ready to go the second you hit the door. So the ER physician can diagnose your heart attack um, before you get here on your way to the hospital, and you can bypass the ER and go straight to the cath lab. That works really well if you're here, um, here in Billings, but if you're from an outlying area, which we know that Montana's you know, pretty far out there, you can have, uh, takes a long time to get to an emergency room. Dr. Duchek was talking about how the goal is to get you, um, to get a stent into your heart within 120 minutes or two hours of the first medical contact. So the first medical person to, to see you. And that's really hard to do if you're somewhere like in Plentywood, where they try to get those patients to Billings. And so part of our program is to help educate and set up standardized order sets in each of those emergency rooms where they can all offer that lytic therapy to help um, break up that clot as soon as possible. And so right now, um, our goal is to have that therapy in place within 30 minutes of hitting that emergency room door. And we've been able to drop that time about 10 minutes since we've started our program. So we continue that education for our healthcare providers across the state. Um, just some statistics we have here. If you call 911, you can have your vessel opened in an average of 47 minutes. If you drive yourself, it will take about 67 minutes to get your vessel open. So because they can transmit that EKG and have the cath lab ready to go, and it's not that sequential pace that you're moving at, but that simultaneous pace, they can get your vessel open much, much quicker and save your heart muscle. It's not wise to drive yourself, no. <laughs> you know, a lot of things can happen when you're having a heart attack. If your heart muscle dies, and it depends on, you know, which vessel it is, you could, you know, you die can pass on the out. way. You can pass out <laughs> because of uh, the heart fails, and you can pass out. You can go to cardi cardiogenic shock. You can go to a high degree AV block when the conduction system fails, because remember, conduction system is viable tissue. If the heart is not getting oxygen, the conduction system would, will fail. So you can go to high degree AV block or simply if the muscle, if the muscle doesn't get oxygen, it becomes very irritable and can produce very serious rhythm problem like ventricular tachycardia. What it means, the lower chambers which are responsible to pump the blood out, they just go so fast. There's no time for the heart to be filled with blood and you simply die. So yes, it's really unwise to drive to emergency room when you're having heart attack. <laughs> Great question, though. And we, we've had cases here where people do try that, and it, it's just not. There's the things that can happen, obviously, just like Dr. Duchek's describing, where we've had patients either, you know, their heart stops and, they're, and they end up actually wrecking into the hospital or they don't make it here. So, again, we're trying to get EMS, the, the ambulances, to you we want you to call them. They can get to you. They can start some of this treatment, get the transmission. We can do everything simultaneously that direction. But great question. How long after you make the 911 call did the ambulance pull your driver? What's the average time for that? So it depends on where you're at. How long it takes for the ambulance so, to actually come to the patient? Um, in Montana, we look at it uh, as an entire state. So I can't really look at it city to city. But, and, well, they, I, can, I can comment on yeah, that. Yeah, go right John. ahead. So we do track it. Um, and that's something within our own um, EMS agencies through the local ambulance services that provide that service in both hospitals that we meet and talk about that. And we look at their times to make sure they're providing appropriate response time within 20 minutes, you know, and, and we know they're providing the care that the community needs because that is something that they actually 
sign on the dotted line with the city to say, okay, we're going to provide this service, and we want to know they're providing the quality care that you guys need out there in the community. So what is the average time You know, average, it's probably, you know, in the past when I, it was probably in the low teens. Uh, the, the question was, what is the average time here? It's probably in the low teens. Um, a lot of times when you call 911 also, 911 also, you're getting the fire department maybe the first that responds because that's how we run our, our local services here is they'll respond. Who the fire department has paramedics also with some of the resuscitation equipment and they can get some of that started as well. And we've actually given the transmission will ECG equipment to our fire departments here in town because they're often there within um, five minutes Correct. or less depending on where they're stationed. And I can see the EKG on my iPhone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the average time in Montana, when you include, you know, kind of our city areas and rural, is about 28 minutes. And that is something we monitor with those times, is to make sure they've got enough ambulances to support all our growing areas too within the, within the county. I'm curious what the uh, percentage is for genetics determining your longevity. It seems like that number. Of Um, can you repeat the question? I can't really. What is genetic? What part does genetic play in a person's longevity? Well, I don't know if we can actually accurately answer this question. I don't think there's any study done in the past where they actually look. We know that certain uh, uh, diseases are connected to uh, genetic predisposition, high cholesterol. So, you know. How this affect? I actually don't agree. I think the life is longer. I think we all live longer because we are aware more and more. I mean, you can see. I mean, United States. I think we live the longest, maybe after the Greek people. Um, but I think the genetic part. There's no study which will accurately tell you. I think the part which we can affect just because we know is genetically connected. We can kind of influence, and you know, environment also will affect. So there's couple of different factors we can, which can affect the genes. We know this. They can either bring disease or, you know, change the course of disease. But the part which we can do is the one which follows, you know, the weight, the, the uh, diet, uh, cholesterol, exercise. That's something which will affect. So the genes, I think, I would leave on the side. There's really nothing we can do. Uh, you know, healthy environment, I'm pretty sure will help because we know some congenital heart diseases are connected with environmental exposure, infection, or so forth. So, but I don't think there's anyone who will be able to answer this question accurately, and I'm sorry. So the question is, can you have a heart attack if you have a pacemaker? Because a, a, a lot of people do have pacemakers. Dr. Ducek? Actually, there's no connection. I mean, pacemaker, most of the time you receive your pacemaker because of conduction pr problem. Either, you know, the heart is in nature of fibrillation and goes too fast, or simply the conduction system, as we get older, and I'm sorry, kind of starts to fail. That's the price we pay as we get older. So, but uh, the heart attack, you, of course you can have heart attack with the pacemaker. Those things are not really connected. There are patients who end with pacemaker after heart attack when that area is really damaged and they need, a, they need a pacemaker, but not the other way. I mean, you can have pacemaker because you, let's say you've got this because you had high degree AV block, you can, or maybe you were born with congenital heart block and now you need a pacemaker and then five years later you come with the heart attack. So yes, you still can have. But you won't have it. <laughs> Great questions. Joni, Sort of the last little piece we wanted to cover just briefly. And again, we're fortunate that uh, Joni was one of our exercise physiologists in cardiac rehab. TJ obviously attended, and Dr. Ducek's our medical director for cardiac rehab as well. Um, if you guys could talk about some of the benefits of that, and I know you talked a lot about that, Dr. Duchek. Oh, I can talk about I exercise another hour. That's my life. I just did push-up 12 with 45 pounds on my back, so. <laughs> so, <laughs> hands up. So, I love exercise. And honestly, and uh, you may see, you know, some of you can say she's a little crazy, but honestly, you have no idea how you really feel when you go and you sweat. 
It takes care of depression, makes you happier. You have your endorphins on the board. You go and you can face, like I did my exercise six o'clock in the morning, and I know I can face it. I can face it, I can deal with stress, I can f f deal with difficult patients, because there are some difficult patients. They come with different problems, different <laughs> questions, and you still have to kind of s switch the angle and, and help them with this. Some of them just coming to talk. So exercise is absolutely, I would say, like the panaceum for everything. Everything. The stress, you're going to be happier, you're going to lose weight, it's going to help the cholesterol, the good cholesterol goes up. The triglycerides are going to go down because you're going to lose weight. It's going to help the diabetes. So there's, I mean, it's just the whole cascade. And again, I still don't know why we don't do it. This is what absolutely kills me. I don't know why. Don't tell me you can't find a time. Of course you have. You can. If there is a will, there is a way. And if you cut down the time you watch TV, which is useless, the time you are on the phone, okay, you, I can assure you every day you can squeeze 30 minutes, at least, easily, no question. Doesn't matter how busy your schedule is and how it's gonna make you feel is amazing. I've been exercising with my trainer and I don't recommend this, it's just me. That's the way I chose and I became bodybuilder and I enjoy this. But if it, it took me it, I had moments when, oh, I'm going to cancel, I don't feel good. It took me three months to bring this exercise as a habit. But to implement and become permanent habit takes two years. Now, I've been with him five years, I can't stop. I actually have my uh, meetings and everything around my exercise. This is how important it is. Cardiac rehab is as important as the aspirin, Lipitor, whatever cholesterol medication you take. Because this is something what is gonna show to you that you still alive despite the heart attack. There's so much you can do. It's gonna actually help the blood pressure and stress. It's gonna help you to lose weight. On top of this, you're gonna meet wonderful people. When I go there, it's like a family. I'm telling you, they talk and they kind of support each other. They call each other, hey, come tomorrow, we're gonna exercise is very important and it's actually in the guidelines, ACC guidelines, the same like whatever use you talk about. This is actually class one indication. The whole uh, circle, uh, this beautiful lady just showed, the 911, the EKG, this is absolutely class one indication. So we actually do follow the guidelines. American College of Cardiology, everything is in the guidelines. So if you open, you can read even more. So we have to support this because guess what? This works.